This is something to talk about from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, We're sponsored by Fieldstone Communities Bainbridge Island, which offers innovative and compassionate care, and they're now accepting residents. They also offer day stay and respite programs. To learn more, call 360-689-4314 and schedule a tour of their apartments on Rolling Bay. Also, I'd like to mention that the Senior Community Center is on the ancestral homeland of the Coast Salish, specifically the Suquamish tribe, the people of the clear salt water. We honor them and are grateful for their hospitality in their ancestral homeland. Today, we are going to take another trip with the Bainbridge Island Photo Club. This month, Chuck Eklund. That's you, Chuck. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for uh, agreeing to show your pictures online as well as on the ledge every week or every month, rather. We get another wonderful example of the talents of the Bainbridge Island Photo Club, and we are grateful for working with you on that. You brighten up the center, and obviously you are also a pretty vigorous group yourselves. So tell us a little bit about the um, the pictures that you assembled uh, this month, and I will put them up on the screen, Chuck. Okay. So first, I'd like to thank you, Reed, and um, this is a wonderful opportunity for us. And I also want to thank Richard Kessler, um, who takes in the pictures and makes them into a, a slideshow so we can look at them. Go to that first one is the water tower. Yeah, you are welcome. And I'll just say a little that that I guess the theme of this these photos are all uh, the same basic location, Battle Point Park. Yeah, yeah. I called it a walk in the park. So um, the f I don't know what other people think when they first the first time they go to Battle Point Park, but. Um, the first time I went there, I saw this water tower, and um, it captured my attention for a long time. And just to give you an idea, a perspective, if you look in the right-hand corner, that is a man walking along the fence line there. So it can give you an, give you an idea of how big the water tower is. I think the water tower was built in 1941, at the beginning of World War II, when the facility really became important. But um, I'm, I also find it interesting that the name of it, Battle Point Park, goes back to the Suquamish people and a battle that was fought on this location um, by, the Kit, by uh, Chief Kitsap leading the Suquamish Indians against invaders from Canada, who historians speculate were down um, to steal women. Um, I guess Canadians weren't as nice then as, as they are now. Uh, <laughs> and, and apparently the Suquamish women were quite a lure, so there you right, go, combination. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, it, it's a huge water tank, and uh, whenever when I first saw it, it, it always reminded me of um, the Orson Welles uh, broadcast. I didn't hear it live, but in 1938, he did a broadcast of War of the Worlds, and um, it was a radio broadcast, of course, and he, instead of doing it like a play or a show, he... Uh, they pretended like it was a live news broadcast and that the world was being invaded and taken over by Martians, created a huge hubbub across the country. So whenever I see this tower, I think of all the farmers that went out then with their shotguns and in these small towns shot up water towers and whatever else they thought looked like a Martian invading. Um, the interesting thing about the park is it was important to the U.S. military during World War II and during the Korean War. There was a, a radio tower in the park. There were several, but there was one in particular that brought in contact with the entire Pacific fleet. And it was actually about 200, 
300 feet taller than the Space Needle. So it was gigantic. Bainbridge Island bought the, the uh, facility from the Army, or no, from the Navy, from the government for a dollar back in 1971. And um, Fort Lewis sent over an engineering brigade. And as a training exercise, they changed it from what it had been to what it is today, a park for the public. But um, I've and, always- And been, also a very popular location for our pickleball players now. Yeah, well, <laughs> this is Bainbridge Island being the home of pickleball. They, they just finished um, a big tournament there that went on for uh, four days. And uh, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of cars, a lot of people, a lot of spectators. So it was a, a pretty big thing. Um, and I, I did this in black and white because to me, the water tower is um, still potentially a Martian invading. So kind of got that Martian feeling for me. And the well is 900 feet deep. I don't know what most of our wells are, but that sounds pretty deep to me. So the next one. Um, so this is the time of year. In fact, I think we saw our first Canada geese in the park the, the other day. And um, this was taken in October um, or November, I can't remember. And uh, the north end of the park has um, an area that only fills up with water during the fall and the, the winter. And uh, it had just started filling up and these Canadian geese were taking the opportunity to get a little bit of rest. And uh, it was early in the morning and the trees around the, that pond had all turned to their fall colors. And I really liked the, the look. I had hoped that um, both geese would put their head up and I could get them looking majestic and going across. And then I decided, actually, this is what they wanted to do. And it's probably a good idea to have one guy looking around while the other one's eating. So that's what was happening. Another characteristic of the park is that benches are installed um, remembering the loved ones who have passed. And there's quite a few in the park. I like this one in particular. Um, I call the picture solitude. Seems like it's a very quiet place to, to sit and think. And um, the trees are, are uh, beautiful. And um, I thought they looked even better in black and white. And that's, that's why I did this picture that way. And obviously you can see they're just, the trees are losing their leaves and pretty soon will be stark and bare. Um, this is last year's berries and um, it was taken in December. Um, if you walk around the park now, uh, the berries are in full bloom. In fact, um, my wife snags berries in the park and always has a few as, as we walk through. Um, they look beautiful with the berries on them and full of life and everything, but um, it struck me uh, how beautiful it looks even after the berries are gone and it's kind of given up its role. And in this picture, obviously a spider had chosen to this area as a place to finish off any late berry um, hunters that might be small enough for them to catch. I'm guessing you had to uh, move around a little bit to make sure you got the light just right there. Yeah, well, it was, yeah, I did. Um, it was, uh, it was nice. It was backlit, which a lot of times when we're taking pictures of things, uh, 
it's something that uh, enhances a lot of photographs. So uh, in this case, it was backlit and it made the, the web stand out and actually the, the former berries also. So sometimes um, winter comes to the park. This is the main pond and um, probably the pond and then this gazebo are the most um, obvious parts. This is a panorama. Um, I think I had four photographs stitched together going across. Um, and obviously snow, it was taken this last December. Um, kind of a funny thing, which I have pictures of, but I didn't include here, is that when the pond freezes over, the ducks don't completely give up. They sometimes walk around on the ice. And uh, it's obvious that web feet are not meant to navigate ice. So they, they look even clumsier than they normally do when they're walking. This is a great blue heron. And it took me a long time to get this picture. Um, not, not in a single day over a period of days. I would approach the heron who was busy fishing and I didn't want to disturb his main uh, line of employment, which was catching fish in the pond. And, but I would get, I wanted to get close enough to get a, uh, to get a good photograph. And, uh, he'd take off and leave. And so finally, after a while, I don't know if he got tired of taking off and leaving every time I approached him, or he just decided I was harmless, or I don't know, but he allowed me to get fairly close and, and get this picture. They, to me, they are very beautiful and elegant birds when they're standing still or they're in the water. When they're flying, they don't look so elegant, but they, they certainly move nicely. Um, this is in the springtime, a man walking in the park. The park was foggy. It's a wonderful place when it's foggy and a wonderful place to walk. And um, I just like the image of the man disappearing and his, and his trusty companion disappearing into the fog on the trail. And again, I thought black and white was a um, something that fit the mood and and the uh, pictures and another example of using backlighting to great effect yeah well i in this i was lucky you know i came around the corner and here he was moving moving down the trail and the sun was coming through the fog so but uh yeah you know and reed i'm hearing more and more photographic comments from you as as I go to these you know should we be shipping you a membership from <laughs> the photo club here? I need to I, I I need to uh quasi retire a little bit so I have time to go to these events yeah. at the senior center because they're great um this is a a female American widgeon and um it's interesting in the duck world, it seems to me that most of the male ducks are the showboats. They have the great plumage and the colors and, and everything like that. But in the case of the widgeons, I, I think the male looks okay, but the females really are kind of a nice, subtle beauty. And in this picture, I like the fact that there was a reflection of her and I like the green of the foliage, the way it was coloring the water and how it kind of contrasted with the colors that existed um, in the duck. So um, to me, this is what lily pads are really for. Um, they're beautiful and they sit out in the water, but they, they really become useful and fun when the ducklings discover them and start mar marching around on the top of them. So mom is there and she knows they're all pretty safe. 
and uh, it's a good spot. And uh, they're they're strong enough to hold the ducklings up. Of course, later that that isn't the case. Yeah, I imagine it's a little bit like your uh, your puppy that knows how to get underneath the chair until it doesn't <laughs> fit anymore. <laughs> The ducklings say, what happened to this lily pad? It used to be such a nice place to sit. Yeah, right. <laughs> I also love the blooms in there. They offer a great, uh, uh, what, uh, they lift up the color in the ducklings too. Yeah. Yeah. So over this last year or, or two years ago, the pond sprung a leak. And um, the water level went down precipitously. And um, that went on for quite a while. But the park district did a great job of repairing it and fixing it. And I think the system is even better now. But when the water level came back up uh, this spring um, and the ducklings um, arrived, uh, we noticed that the, the ducks and the ducklings wouldn't go into the water. They were kind of sitting on the shoreline watching. And um, it soon became obvious that there was a river otter who had taken up a uh, residence in the pond and uh, the ducks were not gonna chance themselves or, or their babies um, in the pond. And, we speculated that the river otter came over to the pond and had easy accents because he came through this drainage pipe. And then all of a sudden, the ducks were out in the water swimming around and um, the river otter was gone. And we were walking by this pipe and I looked over and here was this raccoon. And um, I don't know if the raccoon was hired security by the ducks, <laughs> but, or if it was just a coincidence, but the river otter um, was gone and uh, we haven't seen him back since then. And apparently uh, the raccoon hasn't created any problems for the ducks, but the raccoon definitely looked like it had taken ownership of that uh, drainage pipe. <laughs> So to me, this is a sure sign of summer. Um, I love dragonflies and um, I had never really uh, paid close enough attention and noticed this particular dragonfly is a uh, white-tailed dragonfly. And um, I think it was called a common white-tailed dragonfly, even though I haven't seen very many of them. I guess there, there must be a lot of them. Um, and just the fact that this particular dragonfly is here is amazing because um, in the larval stage, I think uh, they have a mortality rate of like 99.9%. .9%. And um, once they make it through that and they come out and they're flying around the pond and doing their things, they really only have a three week lifespan and, um, and then they're gone. But uh, beautiful, delicate, and um, I enjoyed taking a picture of them. Yeah, that's uh, lovely. And uh, I don't know how hard it is when you're looking at something that is that moves around that much to try to capture it in a in a in a location. Yeah, I was just kind of waiting for for him. I, I thought I would get one flying, but that, that turned out to be, couldn't get one to come close enough. But this guy finally, I guess, got tired and uh, took a quick break. And I took the opportunity to capture him. But I, I haven't seen, I've seen a few dragonflies still, but I, I haven't seen any white uh, tails any uh, recently. And uh, this was taken near the end of June. And I think we saw them around for another week or two, and then that was basically it for this season. But a sure sign of summer. Yep. We still have a little summer left ourselves, even if uh, uh, our dragonfly does not. Well, thank you very much for this uh, review of these wonderful images. Thank you, I Reed.
I always look forward to this every month. And uh, as usual, Chuck, you did not disappoint. Thank you. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any comments or questions for Chuck? I, I had a question on the dragonfly. Um, what kind of lens are you using? Could you get close to him or did you have to have a long lens? You know, I had um, a telephoto that went from 80 to 300. So this was 300 and he was, okay. he was on a reed that was out in the pond ways. Oh, so so it's, cropped, it's cropped also, That's but beautiful. there was a lot of light fortunately. So um, yeah. Really nice photos, Chuck. Um, I enjoyed hearing the history. Um, and when I first moved to the island, gosh, almost 40 years ago, I went to Battle Point and um, I found it kind of a boring park because it wasn't very grown up and it just seemed so wide open. And then over the years, it's just the trees growing. Now it's one of my very favorite places to go. <laughs> so, it, it, it is an amazing place. Concerts mm -hmm. um, during the summer, movies during the summer, um, pickleball, as Reed pointed out. Um, there is, uh, now that we have the Kraken, the um, hockey rink, which is an ice, but skates, has become very popular. So lots of kids are interested in that. So possibly yeah. some future Kraken stars going in there. And then of course, soccer and um, baseball. And then that sport where girls run around with sticks and beat each other <laughs> across. <laughs> but, uh, well, they do, <laughs> Jane. <laughs> Didn't quite think of it that way, but uh, your photos are just beautiful, really. And they capture so many different aspects of that park. Um, just thank you. His Really, uh, really gorgeous. Thank you. It's a great park. It really is. When I, I always, I think about uh, Ken Burns um, National Park video that he did and his statement that the national parks were America's, one of America's greatest inventions. Um, parks like this are also great inventions. And, mm -hmm. and this one seems to continue to grow in its uh, usage and even has an observatory. How many parks have an observatory? <laughs> Not very many, so. There's so much variety there.